Hi Wayne, we thank God that you're here again. You've been with us last year and there you talked about the LGBTQ movement and mostly about the expansion of the movement in our church. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to introduce yourself just briefly for those who do not know you very well. Sure, uh, I'm Wayne Blakely and um, I grew up in an Adventist home, Christian home, and developed same-sex attraction and found that I didn't ask to be this way and the church was very silent. Um, I saw a lot of people looking at me and whispering about me and even went to our Adventist Christian school where I was being teased and bullied and harassed and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so at 18 years old, um, I was working for Loma Linda University and um, there was an orderly there that um, put me in touch with his roommate who said, oh, you're gay. And I said, well, what is that? I didn't even, hadn't heard of it before. And he said, you like guys, don't you? And I said, it's starting to look that way. And then he invited me over and we had a conversation and he said, you know, um, Adventism breeds homosexuality. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, you're gay, I'm gay. Uh, I go to La Sierra University. There's a lot of gay guys there. The church has done a great job of telling us that homosexuality is sin, and then they're dead silent, and they say absolutely nothing. So that was it. That catapulted me actually into the LGBT community, and I lived there for 40 years and um, was looking for love in all the wrong places and found some relationships that you know lasted for a period of time, but there still wasn't that wholeness and that completeness. You know, Something was missing particularly when it came to the point of wondering about life beyond this life. So after those 40 years, you know, I, I began to contemplate Jesus again, and I said, you know, certainly God must have answers and solutions. And I asked him, you know, what do you want from me? And his response to me was that he wanted intimacy. He wanted to court me much, well, he wanted me to court him much like he had courted me. You know, spending time with him, getting to know him, trusting him, uh, investing myself in him, and as a result of that, that I could live with him forever. And, you know, that sounded pretty good to me. So that came with the price of denying myself for Jesus Christ, because as I read through Scripture, um, God does not make um, any allocation for a same-sex sexual relationship and so um, I knew that it was only going to be Jesus that would be able to see me through this um, living my life for him and denying my flesh mm. but I believe that Jesus is worth it um, and I don't think everybody has to go down this road but God allowed me to go down this road and to meet a lot of dead ends and brought me out of it so that I might be able to share what happened in my life with somebody else so that they would see that, you know, staying with Jesus is preferable. You don't need to, to go live in the world and then try to come back. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. If we follow your story, we can see that this emptiness in your heart you try to fill with um, what's supposed to look like it can actually give you this purpose of life. Right. But after a while, you found out it doesn't. Right. And that was the starting point where God pulled you out of this movement because you have been very active in this movement. Yeah, I was living, basically I was living by my feelings and what my flesh was telling me. And the flesh can be gratifying for a moment, <clears throat> but anybody who, whether they're LGBT or not, can tell you that if we cave into our feelings, you don't always have good results. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting that you mention it because I believe that your ministry is very, very important. And I would like to ask you a personal question because I know that many people who see your ministry and who are pro the LGBTQ movement, they accuse you and your co-workers that you might be too old, no. that you do not understand the desires and wants of young people. Right. And they may even say, oh, they live in celibacy, mm -hmm. they have no more joy in their lives, they are sad. How do you feel about these accusations? even if it comes from within your own church? Yeah, I think that, first of all, for any skeptic, 
um, you have the right to be skeptical and you have the right to make the choice that you want to make. But if you're looking to live a life for Jesus Christ, then I would suggest that you would see God's word as trustworthy. And uh, the Bible tells us that uh, a person that is older generally has a great deal of wisdom. Uh, unfortunately, my wisdom came through experience. I didn't need to go down that road, but I did, and God still ha managed to hold his hand over me, um, knowing that one day I would give my heart over to him. And so there are people that write articles, and I think they do it from an ignorant standpoint because they don't call me and ask me any questions. And they make a lot of um, observations um, based on their opinion, maybe not necessarily based on truth. <clears throat> yes, um, I'm, I choose to live celibately for Christ. Um, and I would say right up front that in my walk back with God, it hasn't been without failure. I mean, some people are of an opinion that when you give your life over to Jesus Christ, you live a life that's perfect that's the goal by all means, and it's certainly the perfection of Jesus Christ. But <clears throat> God also knows that, that we arrived here with the stain of sin on us. And so in our walk with God, it may be for some people that, that they, you know, they fall off the pathway. And Proverbs 24, 16 says that, you know, a righteous man falls, you know, seven times. And and First John tells us that if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. And so it was important for me, you know, even after I had years of ministry where there was no failure and that I caved in to my, my feelings, something was broken. And that's, that indicates to me that I have a greater need for Christ, you know, when I'm broken as opposed to when you're not having failure. Yeah, that's a good point you mentioned. And I would like to put this whole movement now into our beautiful little Germany because we had some issues in the past mm -hmm. particularly this year in the beginning of the year where it came very close and many of us never imagined that this would come thus close as it did but on January the 7th a preacher in the north of Germany outed himself as bisexual and it was a surprise for many of us but he basically said in this sermon that God created him that way that there is nothing he can do about his feelings. And later, he also said that it does not affect his ministry. The union then created an ethic committee which decided what to do with him. And even though it's in contrast and very contra in contradiction to the Bible, they said they will not take away his, um, him of being a pastor, mm -hmm. but they want him to open the doors for people of this movement. Yeah. Do you think it's possible for people who have these affections, which are in contradiction to the Bible, to open doors for people from the LGBTQ movement to pull them to Christ? Oh, well, not to Christ. <laughs> you know, we'd, I would say those people would are more in a position to influence a person to live by their feelings and to do what their flesh is crying out for, but it's not in agreement with what Scripture says. So this was a very dangerous move um, that's still being watched from the world. Um, the world church is, is taking note of how this is being dealt with. When this first happened, um, it was quite um, alarming to, to people around the world. And of course, I had read an article about it. And then the, it was, after it was announced, it was um, then indicated that the European division said, oh, hold on, wait a minute. Um, we know that this is not the right way to live. And so, you know, we're, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at the union. We're, we're not going to necessarily just leave him holding his credentials and continuing to preach. Mm. Well, that's been months ago now, and it's dead silent. And so, you know, now I've been told by, by someone, a trustworthy source, who tells me that the decision is, is that as long as he doesn't practice um, this behavior, that he will be allowed to continue, you know, as a bisexual pastor. So that sends a very confusing message because I don't see anywhere in scripture from beginning to end that tells me that somebody can live against what the word of God says, let alone 
be, you know, it's one thing to be same-sex attracted. Now, you know, the Bible's even telling us that even in a heterosexual relationship that you would live um, with, with one woman for, for life, you know, as a man. And so this, when you say you're bisexual, that's indicating to me that not only may you live towards the desires of a woman, but you'll also live, you know, live towards the desire of a man. And there's nowhere in scripture that can support that. <clears throat> so I have to ask questions. Does God know the beginning from the end? Did he write the word for all time? Can I trust God's word? Because if I answer yes to all those things, then I quickly know, and we certainly would know as a world church, let alone just the European division, that we have a great compromise on our hands and you instantaneously would not leave this person in a position of influence, I'm speaking from, from the pulpit, because of the consequences of what that can bring. Yeah, I totally agree on that, what you say. Um, you said that you spoke to a responsible from the union, and he basically said they had meetings with this pastor, they talked to him, they didn't take away their credentials, and in the ending they said, you can continue in your ministry as long as you do not live out what you feel in your heart. Do you think this is an appropriate approach to this issue? Well, no. I, you know, as I indicated, I think that given the, the depth of, of what the declaration meant, that the person should be removed from their position. And <clears throat> I don't think that we, you wouldn't necessarily need to disfellowship him immediately, but you would want to counsel that person and help them come back to a biblical sound viewpoint before, you know, before there is um, a decision about what, what's going to be done. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. And um, I know that you have also experiences with people like uh, this pastor who outed himself in America. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples about pastors who gave their outcoming? Mm -hmm. And how does the church in America deal with it? Unfortunately, this is becoming the, the tone of the day. So at Andrews University, there have been three uh, pro-gay um, or LGBT activists that have graduated from the seminary. So we have Paul Turner, Alicia Johnston, and Kendra Arsenault. Um, and today they all advocate for homosexuality, um, speaking even at seminars on our campuses today. Um, so my, my own personal ministry and another ministry um, are the only two ministries within the Adventist denomination that are holding a biblical view. And we can't get on to university campuses to share the gospel, to show that there's redemption and that a person can live a life with Christ, with an identity in Him, as opposed to living after your flesh. And so now we have seminars that are being uh, promoted and taking place on our campuses of which tithes and offerings go to pay the faculty. And um, it's mind boggling to me that, that no one is stepping in and saying, no, that, that can't happen in this church. You know, this is not a welcome position. Um, and so um, we're at a, at a time in Earth's history where it's important that as members, we're not looking to leadership um, as it relates to salvation. Of course, we never should have looked to leadership for salvation. But I know that when I was younger, I was considering that I only needed to look to leadership beyond the Bible to know that if I was doing the right thing. And now leadership is even you know, turning away from the word of God and going after what, what culture is saying. Maybe you can specify on that point. Is there a certain danger which comes from such a pastor for the flock of Christ? If you have somebody speaking against scripture from the pulpit, then that's going to have influence not just on children, but on adults as well, to think that there is a different gospel. Galatians says that if someone's preaching a different gospel, that that person should be cursed, um, that there is no other gospel. Yeah, and if you look at such a pastor from a certain church promoting these things, what kind of picture does this pastor give you about the church he's into? Well, I guess I would say that they're now giving a cultural or worldview as opposed to a biblical view. 
And you know, when the whole world is speaking about tolerance, about love for your neighbor, about respecting every person's identity, how much of Jesus does such a pastor represent? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't speak for a pastor. I can't say what his motives are uh, for his position, but if you're, pre if you're presenting a position that's in opposition to scripture, then, then you're not really caring for somebody's soul because you're, you're pulling them deeper into a, a world of sin rather than redemption from sin. I think many people misrepresent true tolerance with these false conceptions of tolerance, and that's why they take people captive in these thoughts. On April 22nd, there was held a meeting in a church here in the north of Germany, and they wanted to educate the church, the brothers and sisters, and all the people connected with it about this LGBTQ movement. And on this afternoon, they basically were teaching that this whole movement is the new normality, that this is part of our lives now, the spirit of the time just moves into that direction. Everyone needs to be tolerant and colorful. And I think that they wanted to pave the way of, of change in the way for the leadership in the congregation with this meeting. And they published an article on their website, which was written by SDA Kinship. Mm -hmm. And SDA Kinship was, I think, the strongest supporter of this meeting. Maybe you can briefly explain what SDA Kinship is for those who do not know about it. Sure. So uh, many years ago, <clears throat> probably 40 plus years ago, there were um, people within the church that had developed uh, homosexuality that were acting out and the church began to um, take disciplinary action. So if you're going to live as a homosexual and live according to your flesh and your desires and by being um, counseled, you decide to continue that way rather than giving that up, um, then you are you know, in a position that you set yourself up for being disfellowshipped from the church. <clears throat> well, the people that were being disfellowshipped from the church were deciding that they couldn't live differently. Um, they weren't going to live a celibate life, and so they decided that they were going to still promote certain things about the Bible, but certainly not the sexual purity. And so they developed an organization called SDA Kinship. Later, the General Conference took SDA Kinship to court saying that you don't have permission to use Seventh-day Adventist in your name. But the judge said, well, I don't see that just using Seventh-day Adventist in a, in a name for something is that unique. <clears throat> and so he ruled for, um, for SDA Kinship to keep the name. Since then, the General Conference has trademarked Seventh-day Adventist so that nobody can go about using that for something else. <clears throat> so it's left in place, but it's, it's suggesting the wrong, you know, it makes it look like SDA Kinship is a, a organization that has the endorsement of the church, and, and it does not. But it actually does not have the endorsement of the church. Right. And in this context, the SDA Kinship is often referred to a book called Guiding Families. Yeah. Um, Guiding Families is an interesting book because the title, and I believe the title is important, you know, about guiding families in these modern times, but the content is different to what you might expect. Right. Um, that's the reason why you wrote another book. You wrote an analysis of this book. Yeah. And can you please tell us a little bit about guiding families sure. and why you thought it necessary to give an answer to this book? Sure, the North American Division made an indication that there was no resources for uh, families and for pastors and teachers um, on the LGBT issue. Well, it was interesting that they made that observation because even when this came about in 2018, Coming Out Ministries and my own personal ministry had already been around for like seven years. So there were certainly resources and there were certainly people that could speak to the issue of homosexuality from a bi biblical position. But the North American Division, the Committee on Human Sexuality, decided to go outside the denomination 
to the author here, Bill Henson, in this book, who has written the same book for other denominations, this Guiding Families book. Uh, Bill Henson actually has a history of having lived in the LGBT plus community, but today is married and has children, which is interesting to me that instead of holding a redemptive view, he's holding a view that Guiding Family promotes that identifying as LGBT is perfectly fine. So a person then identifies by their temptations and their desires instead of who Jesus offers them an identity in, in, our, in Christ as a new creation in Christ. <clears throat> and I think that when you do that, you begin to muddy the waters. Uh, the book goes on to tell people that we should um, uh, call people by the pronouns they wish to be called by. Um, that was confusing to me because I know that God gave us only one spirit, one soul. So if you want me to refer to you as they, then I would think that you were demon demonically possessed because I only know that God would give you one spirit, not multiple spirits. In fact, years ago, uh, before any of this came about, um, you would be referred to a psychologist for having a split personality or having multiple personalities, and that would be seen as a mental disorder. And today, anything that um, suggests that you would live in agreement with scripture is now what's becoming the anomaly. You know, it's, instead of um, pointing out that, that a person who has either multiple personalities or multiple uh, genders is in need of either medical or, or mental health counseling, um, it's seen to be, you know, perfectly normal. <clears throat> I would say that without Jesus, you know, a person can do whatever they want to do. But if I'm going to follow the word of God, and if we're identifying as Christians, then we should be promoting information and materials that is going to draw me into agreement with Christ. And that's not what's happening in this Guiding Families book. The Guiding Families book is a, adopting a cultural viewpoint, <clears throat> drawing people away from Scripture instead of drawing them to Scripture. When, when I'm listening to your words what you're saying now. I do not believe that you need a PhD to understand that Guiding Families is a very, very dangerous book, and especially for young people. Do you have any practical tips how we can protect young children and even teenagers from these illusions written in that book? Yeah, I think a, a missing element in many homes today is the presence of Jesus. I mean, yes, there may be many people that are going to church every week, but to have that intimate relationship with Jesus really require, requires um, parents that are teaching their children that God is trustworthy and putting them in a relationship with Christ each and every day, that they're having personal devotion time and <clears throat> praying to God and, and acknowledging the presence of God in their lives, letting Jesus and his word guide you in your life to know how to fashion your life after after what the word is telling us, the principles, uh, the designs, and, and the teachings of scripture. So I find even in Christian homes today that there may be a reference to the Bible, but as far as a belief in the Bible, they're seeing the word as being archaic and out of date and irrelation. And uh, even now we have, um, in these seminars that are taking place, these pro-gay seminars that are happening on university campuses today, they're seeing, oh, God is not in the Bible. God is in you and I, so you should go with whatever God is telling you in your inner soul. And so to me, that's, that's pantheism. That's not, not true Christianity. Yeah, it is a counterfeit pantheism. Right. Um, maybe some listeners are interested how do you specifically work with those people in your ministry because i believe it might be very hard to go to a demonstration by the lgbtq community and just telling them the truth you cannot really force them to accept the biblical view right how do you and your ministry how do you deal with those people are you waiting for them to come are you reaching out for them how does your work look like i personally don't go into the community of which i was much rooted in at one time. It would probably be a magnet that would pull me and try to get me to stay there. Um, <clears throat> but remember that Jesus was invitational and not forceful. And so I believe as a church community, as a church body, that we can certainly teach um, the youth um, as well as the adults in our church how to be a witness to 
our gay neighbors or to people that we know that uh, in our own family that are identifying as LGBT. You don't necessarily have to go out and campaign in the gay community, um, but certainly in a church community, we should be evangelizing Jesus Christ and helping people understand that true freedom is in Jesus, not in who they think they are. Wayne, there may be some individuals in the church who feel um, very much ashamed of what is happening in our churches right now. Mm -hmm. And they may be asking themselves, what can I as one single person do against this wave of the LGBTQ movement? What can I do when the leadership goes astray? Right. I'm glad you asked that, David. The first, um, you know, prayer should always be our first defense and not our last resort. And so, you know, make this a matter of prayer. I believe that, you know, God is holding his hand. Uh, he's held it for a mighty long time, but prophecy is being fulfilled and we're certainly in the final days on this earth. But your prayers, um, you know, open up the opportunity for, for the Holy Spirit to reach somebody's soul today. Aside from that, I believe that our denomination needs to be held accountable by its members. And we have a body of believers um, who have said that they believe um, the Bible as it reads. And so if you see things that are happening that are in disagreement with Scripture, then you need to either pick up the phone and call um, your pastor, you know, call your union president, call the division president, um, the general conference. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to call or write letters and you, know, you want to be specific. You know, I observed this seminar in this location and it is not in agreement with the word of God because the word says this and the seminar said that. Make sure that you are being perfectly clear about what the, the controversy, the contradiction is about. Um, rather than just going, oh, the church is heading in a bad direction, you know, because they'll just take that letter and throw it in the trash. And I believe that you did exactly this. You wrote something, yeah. you did phone calls. Can you explain to us why you wrote this book in response to guiding families? Yeah, I actually received a phone call. It was actually somebody that was employed by the General Conference who said, um, would you write an analysis of this book, um, Guiding Families? And, you know, when I had that request made to me, I was like, oh, why do I want to go through a bunch of garbage to try to um, reveal some kind of light? I mean, it just, it took me a year and a half to write the book. First of all, I had to pray intently about it. <clears throat> and then God made it very clear to me with, a, with, with an answer to prayer that was, that was, um, there, was there was nothing else but the direction from the Holy Spirit that I needed to write the book. <clears throat> and so I wrote the analysis. I called it line by line because I go through all of Guiding Families and I go through it line by line to see there are some things in, in, in Guiding Families that is appropriate, but there is much in Guiding Families that is not appropriate. So I needed to delineate between the two. At the end of it, I said, you know, Lord, a lot of people know Wayne Blakely's opinion. I need something more than that. I need something that points to you. And so I included in the book um, seven testimonies of those identifying as Adventists who have left the LGBT community. But more importantly, I showed that this was a, a, a global issue in that I took and added another 14 testimonies uh, from people of other faiths showing that the Bible still reads the same to them in all these different denominations. They still had the redemptive approach to denying self for Christ and coming and living for him instead of the, um, the deceptive nature of what Satan is trying to put before us. Now let's suppose in my local church, the leadership decides to infiltrate the church with these LGBTQ ideas. How should I as a member behave in my church then? Well, as a student of scripture, I think that it's important that we would follow the Matthew 18 principle, and that would be to, to go to the person of which you believe that is in error and bring to their attention. You know, I don't think this is in direct um, agreement with scripture, 
and you know talk it out pray it out together and if there is a resistance to that or no desire to change then I think you need to come back with another brother or sister who is also in agreement with scripture and again if there is no um, resolution uh, you got to begin to look at your options you know are you going to be able to um, be successful in helping this church body understand that we need to stick with how scripture reads uh, because if if it's too big of a deal and that's not going to happen then you need to find a, a place in which you can worship where people are in agreement mm. another word which is often mentioned when you talk to people from that movement is identity they say yeah that's my identity i was born this way i was made this way whatever why do you think this identity issue is such a big thing? Well, I think we have to look at that a couple of ways. You know, it's okay if somebody says that that's their identity, they can, yeah, you can go on and be LGBT, like I mentioned earlier. Without Jesus, you can do whatever you want. But you would not want to be a believer and maintain an identity of gay Christian or LGBT Christian. Because what that does is that if you put that before Christ's name, it says who comes first, what becomes first. So gay meaning I'm a person who desires to have intimate relations with someone of the same gender, Christian. Well, I just told God, get out of here because I'm going to do what I want to do. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. And why would you want an albatross hanging around your neck, you know, or you know, setting up a situation where now we need to have a section in the church for LGBT people where everybody else is struggling with temptation, but they're not identifying all those different temptations. You know, what if we have somebody who, who is in a relationship, who's married, um, and yet he sees that a woman is attractive, and he, you know, but he doesn't act on his attraction. He therefore doesn't run around the church identifying as a non-practicing adulterer. That would make no sense. Or, you know, I'm tempted to steal, but I don't steal. So I'm a, a non-practicing Christian thief. You know, none of those things make sense. So it's peculiar to me that we've taken LGBT and set it aside from everything else that is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and we're treating it much differently than we do all the other things that are listed. Mm. I like the thought that you mentioned that whatever you put before the word Christ and Christian is actually self-service. Yeah. Would you agree that um, being in this movement, calling yourselves a gay Christian is even idolatry? Yeah, you'd, it'd be an idolization of self and that's what's happening with all the queer theology that's coming out, God is no longer the focus, self has become the focus. And so <clears throat> that would be having another God before you. What is interesting to me is how do you, as you're in your ministry, work with people in that community? Because actually your purpose is to call them out of their movement. How do you approach them? You know, Jesus is a, is a God of invitation. So, you know, there are those um, in uh, like a Christian so-called Christian organization, um, Westboro Baptist Church. They go into the gay community. <clears throat> they say gays will burn in hell. They go to funerals of, of military men that were gay, and they protest against the, the funeral and saying that the person is going to rot in hell. And these horrible things. No one is beat to the foot of the cross. A person should be invited. And so... Yeah, if you want to go into the gay community and you have a pamphlet that you would like to hand somebody to invite them to church or something, that's great. But I don't think that we should be forcing. Jesus never forced himself upon anyone. And yet we need to be invitational in our environment. There are ways for us in our church services to evangelize Christ to people who are suffering with same-sex attraction or with gender ideations showing that Christ is trustworthy. Um, there are many, you can invite your neighbors, you know, if you have gay neighbors in, you can have them over and, and serve them a, a lovely meal. And, and then when they leave, pray for them, you know, ask God to help you to continue to be able to minister them to them. Because I have seen even gay couples 
break up and say, no, we want to live for Christ now, not for how we used to live. So, you know, don't limit God because God is in the business of miracles. All things are possible through him. Yeah, we definitely shouldn't limit God. And I believe that the best way of reaching those people is by practical service. Mm -hmm. Because as you mentioned in your own story, all of these people are, they are searching for their purpose in life. They have this big gap in their hearts, trying to fill it, but they are trying to search for the purpose in the wrong direction. Yeah. And I think by representing Christ, you can actually reach for them. They're really hungry for, we're all hungry for love. And so when you treat somebody the way you would want to be treated, that really is an example of the love that you've experienced from Christ. And you'd be amazed at the kinds of questions that people begin to ask once they see, if they begin to sense that they have value, that they have purpose, they have meaning, then they want to know who you know. And for you, that's going to be Jesus Christ. And that's where we really begin to witness about what's possible through Jesus. Yeah, amen to that. But there's even more that you're doing. You mentioned to me before that you're working on a film project. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about it, what you're doing, whom you're interviewing, and why you're doing this? Well, there has long been a contention um, amongst the LGBT community about um, a term referred to as conversion therapy. And for 12 years in ministry, I was believing that conversion therapy was really something terrible and horrible because I was hearing about shock therapy and putting needles under people's fingers and doing horrible things to people. And I thought, oh, I'm, I could never support something like that. So I even wrote in the book, I don't endorse or condone conversion or reparative therapy. And then I began to um, do some research a couple of years ago, and I found that the accusations that were being made were false accusations, that shock therapy and these torturous kinds of things haven't been done for 70 years. Yet there are laws being written in 31 regions around the world that are now making it criminal for someone, not by force, not taken by force, but someone who's seeking help and wants to to go and talk about why they have same-sex attraction um, in most circumstances and there was a the percentage at one time years ago was 82 percent of those who identify as lgbt did so either from sexual or physical abuse and so you can imagine if there's a traumatic event that happens in someone's life let's say a girl at, at nine years old is molested by her father <clears throat> and at 11 years old she says you know i'm not i'm not female i'm male because she's wanting to keep away any other male that might approach her when what really needs to take place is the dealing with the traumatic incident that took place and finding out that not all men are going to conduct themselves the way her father did so under these conversion therapy laws that are in place around the world today, she would not be able to seek help. It would be criminal for her parents or for her to seek help. And so I began to, to uh, talk to more people, um, talk to um, the legal community, talk to uh, pastors, um, talk to therapists, um, talk to people who have left homosexuality. And I found that it was important that I, I think the truth needs to be told to people. And so I am in the midst of making a documentary that would expose the false narrative and at the same time um, make a call to the LGBT community about what Jesus really is about. Um, Christians, you know, some Christians have, have misbehaved. They have been cruel and mean. Um, by no means what I would say that that's right. But not every Christian is acting that way. There are many who, who are being very loving, very caring, and want to share that with somebody who, who is wanting to know more about Jesus. Again, keeping this in a position of which it's um, ministry that's invitational, not forceful. Um, I don't think it's right to you know, push anyone into a direction that they don't want to go. And I know many therapists um, that speak on this issue, and they said, you know, I would not want to shame anyone, and I don't want to see anybody that doesn't want to be seen. Yeah, there, there are so many rights now restricted by this whole movement, and everything is considered hate speech, yeah. and your freedom of speech is 
basically not existing anymore because everything is hate speech. Um, Wayne, let me ask you a last question. Um, we see that there is some mass mission field in this movement. And we see that this whole issue of LGBTQ is popping up everywhere. We saw it just yesterday in Hamburg. You could see the flags and the colors everywhere, yeah. even on churches. Do you believe um, if we think of Matthew 24 that the LGBTQ movement is able to hasten the end time prophecies? If you consider what Christ said about the times of Lot, which would be the same as yeah. in our days? Well, I think when you think back at where there has been previous destruction via the flood or via Sodom and Gomorrah, um, that today there people are, are told to go with however they feel, and it really doesn't matter how you feel. Everything is being um, becoming legal. You know, pedophilia is now being campaigned for. We knew that that was going to be next. And so um, I do think that as you know, all you have to do is read in Revelation and to know that these things are, are going to come upon us. And, and also, you know, the the Lord tells us that, you know, people will come to a point where he will just give them over to themselves. But I believe that as long as there are people that are praying and that there are still, um, there are sp still souls that can be sought after and that can respond to the redemptive message of Christ and what he did on the cross. If you look for a way to evangelize, you might develop your own tract or a way of inviting somebody, you know, to your church congregation or to show um, that Jesus is definitely the, the authentic uh, representation of love because it will only be love, which the LGBT community is saying love is love. Well, love is love unless you have redefined love and then it's really not love at all. So let's go back to the author of love and respond to his invitation to us. What is your experience with the people in the LGBTQ movement? Are they open for the gospel in general? No. Uh, through our ministries, occasionally there is somebody who will reach out through an email or will you know, see me at a church and, and come and talk to me. Um, but remember that Jesus said that he would die even if it was for one person. I, again, you, you asked about the hastening of, you know, did I think that the movement was hastening the coming of Jesus? I think just in representation of the ministries, and I'm not the only ministry, there are, there are literally hundreds of ex-gay ministries out there today, and they're not having huge results, you know, but there are a number of people that are leaving homosexuality for Jesus Christ. Um, in our denomination, I, I have not seen a, you know, it's certainly not a mass movement out of the LGBT community, but I have seen another ministry of, of where there have been hundreds of people that have come out of homosexuality. But thank you so much for sharing about your experiences. And I thank God for this opportunity we could have now. I believe that there is still there are still, still precious souls out there which shall be sought after. And I think that the answers you gave us by God's grace can be very helpful to this. Now, if any of our viewers have further questions about this issue, you may be free to contact us and uh, ask further questions and we'll be glad to answer them for you. And if there are any more information they wanna have, you can give them out for free now. Now, Wayne, thank you for your time. Thank you that you joined us here. And I would like sure. to pray with you in the ending thank you. that we may still be under God's protection and that God will give us wisdom yeah. how to deal with these people. Because I think it's not an, not an easy issue no. if we come in contact with them in practical life. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity we could have with our brother Wayne, and we thank you for all the insight you have given us through him. May you continue to bless the ministry, but may you also enlighten every viewer how we can deal with these issues in our local churches, in our environment, our neighborhood. And may you help us to stretch out for these people and to reveal Christ to them. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen.